Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 567. Today, Andrew and I are talking about how appropriate force can vary. If you're new to the show, you might want to go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, check out all of our episodes, and you can also go to whistlekick.com, and that's where you're going to see everything that we're working on, all the products, all the projects, all the things that we're doing to support you, the traditional martial artists, because that's what we are. That's what we love. We love training. We love martial arts. And so we're doing everything we can to support you. Why do we do this show? Because we're connecting, we're educating, we're entertaining the traditional martial artists around the world. Hopefully you find some value in what we do. And if you do, well, there are a lot of ways you can give back. You can make a purchase. And if you do, you can use the code podcast15. That'll save you 15%. You could also share this episode with a friend or leave us a review somewhere, or you could support our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. That's where we post exclusive content, everything from book drafts to exclusive audio, even video episodes. And if you contribute as little as two bucks a month, you're going to get access to extra. The more you throw our way, the more we're going to throw back your way. So today, like I said, joined by Andrew. What's going on, Andrew? Not much. How are you today, Jeremy? I'm well, thank you. I'm well. We're uh, excellent. We're rocking the new background. If you're watching this in video, you can see the the un the unironed gray <laughs> background, which I still think is a step up from the cluttered bookshelf. It is. I, I think we're moving forward. We'll get there. Uh, maybe eventually we'll have something that actually has the whistle kick logo on it. But you know what? This was fifteen dollars, and Andrew and I were joking before we started recording that this this is possibly like the best cheap background because it's uh it's a shower curtain <laughs> if you it's had only got found, holes if you had only found one in green you could have then had a green screen you could yeah. have had anything behind you i could have had a green screen maybe i'm sure somebody out there sells you know that that appropriately kind of kelly green shower curtain somebody somewhere's got one maybe i'll buy one and then we can we can be re- we can record from anywhere we can be <laughs> i don't know where would we be the bahamas oh. somewhere warm we're both in a not so warm place it's snowing right now and will not stop snowing for literally months if yeah. i go out in my yard at any point in the next few months and squint hard enough it is snowing there's always snow coming down in some <laughs> some fashion it might be very light but it's there yep yep uh, so so if we were going to be somewhere bahamas jamaica i love jamaica we should mm. we should go there I've only been once. An episode there. Although fun, fun, fun story, completely unrelated to what we're going to talk about. Uh, I, the one time I was in Jamaica, ended up at a dance club, uh, a friend of mine and I from Massachusetts, and we had done capoeira together in college. And so we ended up, we were the only non-locals mm-hmm. and we were doing capoeira on the dance floor. And it was a really <laughs> interesting experience in hindsight, probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> because this was this was not a tourist dance club this was a locals dance club yep and yep. it did sort of um we became the focal point of some some attention mm-hmm. and we'll just leave it at that and not always great attention no nope so uh note to self don't do capoeira at jamaica dance clubs Fair enough. I'll keep that in mind. Life lesson right there. Yeah. So you mentioned, and and this is what sparked the idea for this episode, that someone was talking to you about how deadly force or appropriate force might vary for their particular circumstances. Can you tell me, tell me, tell the listeners more about what that is? Yeah. Yeah. I was talking with uh, uh, one of my best friends, Angela, who, um, you know, got her black belt about a year ago, um, and she's an older woman. has has bad knees. has has had knee issues for a number of years, um, and has trained really hard for the last six or seven years, and and got her black belt. Right. And we were having a discussion about uh, the use of force, and she made an argument, or not an argument. She made a, a statement that made me go, "Hmm, I hadn't thought of that." And the statement was something to the effect of. I, meaning her, I, as a, a 50-year-old woman with bad knees, would be way more likely to have leniency on myself if I were to, if someone were to, you know, confront me on the street and I were to seriously hurt them than Joe Schmo, who's 25 and in very good health. And I said, really? Why is that? And then I thought about it. And it led for a very interesting 
thought process on i i had never thought of that that who you are mm. can change what one would consider appropriate use of force yeah and I'll, I'll agree it's not something i've really thought about myself and when i start to think about circumstances like this when i think about you know philosophical questions you know what is appropriate force and, and forget about the legal stuff for a minute we'll, we'll have to bring that into the conversation obviously sure sure but I find it's easier to think about extremes. So let's imagine a 85 year old woman with a walker and someone assaults her and she manages to lift that walker and catch the assailant in the perfect exact spot, this one in a thousand and the person goes down and is dead. Is that old woman going to get convicted of using you know more force than is necessary i don't think so i mm -hmm. can't imagine that would happen maybe but it seems incredibly unlikely um i, th I think if, if if so you know there would there would be uh, quite a bit of backlash yeah for so sure the other end of the spectrum you know a, a small child a seven-year-old kid maybe they've, they've done a little bit of martial arts and you know somebody tries to kidnap them and they they do something you know poke some eyes out or you know, bite somebody's nose off, you know, something like really extreme and violent and they get away. I can't imagine that kids getting convicted of anything mm -hmm. because they defended themselves and did what they needed to do. But then we kind of come back into the middle and you brought up a 25 year old man in great health. And obviously there is a difference there because well, what's the standard? Their standard is to disengage, right? I mean, it, would you agree that's the goal? Absolutely. You know, get out of the situation that you're in. And that may require you to uh, to be involved in an altercation, you know, fists, feet, whatever, um, you know, maybe a, a throw of some sort. But the mm. objective should be not to destroy the opponent. The 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 uh, the best outcome would be to get away. That should be sure. your number one goal. Get away sure. from the situation. And now I think we start to bring the legal side of it in. And let's remember, laws are different in different countries. Yep. Neither you nor I are lawyers. Nope. We have not passed the bar. I did a little bit of pre-law. I tend to have a good legal mind, but nothing that we're about to talk about is guaranteed to be true in your area, uh, legal in any area, or even, I, I, think, I don't think we're going to promise anything beyond logic. Correct. As we talk through this. Okay. <laughs> and so this is one of those times where if you are an attorney and a martial artist and you're listening and you have feedback or you want to come on the show. Yeah. Let's, let's do it. Let's talk about that sort of thing. Absolutely. That would be awesome. So we, we, we talked about some extreme examples, you know, your friend, Angela, shout out to her. Thank you for, you know, that, that's a, it's a great topic. It's a great thing to talk about. And she's kind of, I, I think culturally we would consider her, further to the edges of the spectrum than kind of this middle ground if we're identifying, you know, a, a mid-20s, strong, healthy adult male, mm -hmm. right? And so if we, if we bring it back to that person, you know, where, where is appropriate force there? Where is the point where I think both culturally or, or socially and legally, because it might be different, where that person is not culpable for what they've done? Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to, I mean, I don't think either of us would want to put a, an age number on it, sure. but it's going to be different for every person, yeah. you know, because you can be, um, you could be 25 and in great health, but you could be, uh, you could have, uh, uh, you could have been an amputee and have, uh, a, you know, a, a prosthetic leg, mm -hmm. right? That's going to be totally different. That person, sh you know, would have a totally different situation for them than someone who has both of their legs. Or maybe they've got two two prosthetic legs, you know? Yeah. Like, that's very different from someone who doesn't. Right. So if we think about it as if appropriate use of force, it, if it is enough force such that you can escape with reasonable confidence that no further harm will be done to you as you are escaping. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that would be my definition of reasonable force. Not, hey, this person tried to mug me. I punched them once. 
I could have gotten away and then I punched them 47 more times, took their wallet and then left. Right? Exactly. That's, that's clearly over the line. Yep. So we're doing as much as we need to, to remain safe and only so much. Now, mm-hmm. of course, there's, there's no guarantee, right? Because, you know, there, there's a line, right? There's a tipping point where any assailant is going to back off, but we don't know exactly where that is. So we're always going to cross that line because you can never know exactly where it is. I would rather overshoot a little bit than undershoot. You know, sure. it goes back to one of my sayings. I'd rather be overprepared than underprepared because I'm never going to be perfectly prepared. And mm-hmm. I think that that applies here. So if, if, we, if we look at that, the ability to get away, I think is really the, the key that we look at. Someone who is, going back to the first example, 85 and using a walker, she's going to need a lot more time. To get away, absolutely. So she's probably going to need to do, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, she's probably going to have to put that person as close to death as she can without killing them. Or at least unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're putting that person down and you are giving yourself a chance to get out. Mm-hmm. The seven-year-old, probably a similar thing. So let's, let's bring it back to healthy. You know, like if, if, as you're imagining this 25 year old in, let's say it's a, it's a one-on-one situation, we'll have to go to multiple attackers in a moment. Cause I think that's a whole different dynamic, but if we're talking about healthy, able, all of their limbs, 25 year old male with, let's say some moderate level of training, you know, they're not some, well, at 25, they're probably not some grandmaster anyway, but <laughs> you know, somebody who's been training three or four years, you know, what, mm-hmm. what do you imagine appropriate force for them? Well, I think before we discuss that, I think the amount of force you use would also depend on where you are. If mm-hmm. I, if that 25 year old is uh, out in the woods hiking with no one else around and they get confronted and attacked, um, the, they could do a technique, which we'll, we can discuss in a moment, and then run away. But if the technique is such that the other person can still get up and run after them, maybe they're a faster runner. Yeah. You know, like I can be in great health and still not be a fast runner. Right. And as opposed to if I am in a city somewhere or, or, you know, in a town and I only need to run a couple of blocks to be within sight of someone else. I don't need to run that far. So I think where we are also plays a factor. Yeah. And as someone who hikes quite a bit in all seasons, yeah, there, there have been times I've been on the trail and there have been sketchy people. I carry a firearm in, in some circumstances when I hike and yeah, it's for the animals, but it's also for, as, as I've heard uh, nefarious people describe two-legged rats. <laughs> Because, yeah, how, how am I going to escape? How am I going to get out? I've got bad knees. You know, I'm not running down a mountain after I punch somebody in the throat one time to get away. It's not going to work out. They're going yep. to catch me. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, context matters you're, because you're, it impacts your ability to get away. Yep. And, and in terms of techniques, I would be a fan of techniques to the legs because hurting someone else's leg isn't likely going to kill them, but is going to make it harder for them to run after you. If their leg, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying break the person's leg, but you kick someone hard in the leg and they, it's going to hurt and they, it's going to hurt them more when they continue to run on it. Right. So if, if, let, let's pull it back from a second though, because if we go too far down the road of specific techniques, it's mm. going to open up this whole can of worms and fair, fair, and, and everything. I, I think giving examples is great, and, and and we should and we will. But let's let's think about what is that defining moment? It's the moment when the attacker is unable to or chooses not to mm-hmm. pursue. Pursue. That's yep. that's the point. It's we have taken their perception of the victim and changed it from no longer a victim that that's that is quote unquote all we have to do with our defense is it simple yes is it easy no mm-hmm. right so if, if we're if we're talking about that psychological change in the assailant to to change that perception we're talking about using 
a level of force that is unexpected, I think. If someone attacks me, they're expecting that I'm going to do something. Maybe they expect me to cower in the corner, but I would imagine that if someone was an attacker, they would have some reasonable assumption that some percentage of people would try to fight back. Maybe it's a crime of opportunity. Maybe they've never done it before. Maybe they don't know. But if someone is a habitual or career criminal in this way, they're going to they're gonna be used to getting in a scrap once in a while. They're going to be used to, you know, catching a punch in the face or, or mm-hmm. something. You know, maybe there's a gun. Maybe there's a knife that completely changes the specifics. But it doesn't change the overall philosophical concept of needing to create the circumstances whereby you are no longer seen as a victim and thus have the ability to get away without the reasonable expectation of pursuit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I I think if we put knife and gun aside for our conversation, because I think it's easier to discuss. Yeah. you agree? Yeah, I would agree for sure. All right. So here we are. We've we've got healthy adult male with reasonable training, and he is accosted by, statistically, it's going to be somebody with some kind of perceived advantage larger most likely if we're not talking about a weapon to Mm -hmm. to um tip the scales this person's going to be bigger okay uh they are probably also in the case of 25 year old male going to be healthy and have some competency or at least confidence in their own fighting skill Mm -hmm. statistically yeah people look for victims and if you don't present as a victim which i'll be honest it's it's the reason that i i've managed to avoid fights i just don't um, I don't see myself as a victim. I don't walk like a victim. I keep my head up. I make eye contact with people, right? Like this is all, this is a whole different subject. But in order to overcome the, I'm a healthy 25 year old male and now somebody wants to attack me, that person's going to be bigger. So what do we do out of the gate? If we, if, if, you know, if, if we've tried to deescalate, if we've tried all that stuff, didn't we talk about deescalation recently? We did. We did. Okay. Not not in a in a lengthy discussion, okay. but yeah, we did. All right. It, it seemed familiar. I thought I thought we had talked about it. Having yeah, a little bit of deja vu. It was it was last week's episode. Was it? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, See? last week from when we're recording. <laughs> <laughs> so I think probably two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, Jeremy. Two weeks ago. Man. My memory is 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 both really good and really bad. So what does this this person have to do to convince this bigger person that they are not a good victim? It's going to have to be violent. Likely, you're not you're less likely to be able to do that with your words. It's going to have to be unexpected. Yep. Right? If you you're 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 bigger than me, if you come you decide that that I'm an appropriate victim and you're willing to engage, you're going to expect that maybe at some point I let's say punch you or slap at you something, right? You're going to expect that there's, there's some attempt at defending myself, especially if the, the further you're willing to take it, the more expectation you would have that I would defend myself. So my defense has to exceed your threshold for willingness to engage. Yep. And what I would expect. Right. So it's got to be reasonably fast. It's got to be reasonably violent beyond what is expected and it has to be effective Mm -hmm. if i swing at you with an open hand and all my fury and lots of screaming and it just kind of glances off your cheek i may have reinforced my victim position Mm -hmm. in your mindset how are we doing so far? Are you, are you with me? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I'm agreeing hundred percent. All right. Now, how does that change for you as an attacker? Sorry if I've, I've shoehorned you into the role of the attacker. I'll be the bad, I didn't I'll really ask guy. permission. That, did I? It's okay. I'll, I'll be the bad guy. Okay. Other than the smile, you could, you could pull off the villain in a movie, you know, it, villains tend to have, be bald. That's true. Right. The, um, Villains, villains tend to be bald. They tend to be um, more physically imposing. I've met and trained with you. You are certainly more physically imposing than I am. Wow. Uh, that's debatable. No, I don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, maybe I've got, I've got the facial hair that sometimes uh, 
Yeah, bad guys have goatees. Bad guys saying. do have goatees. They do. Um, how how I show up, age, etc. Whatever that perception is, I've got to I've got to change that perception for you. And the the more abruptly I can do it, the more concretely I can do it, the more willing you are to disengage and bail. But we're not really talking about your disengagement, right? We're talking about your injury Correct. as a result of my defense. Mm-hmm. So and, and what I and what I as the atta- as the attacker, w- what I deem would be like you, you know I'm I'm coming after you, so I, you need to do something to tell me to stop, essentially. Right, right, and, and I think there's a tremendous amount of it depends in here. I think the circumstances are so multifaceted. Mm-hmm. Because we're not just talking about what gets you out of the situation. Because if if that's all we were talking about, the only thing that mattered was extracting yourself safely. The answer every time would be to kill the attacker. Yeah. Right. That that's. I mean, that's that is a simple, not easy, but a simple standard that we could draw. But socially and for your own mental state, as well as legally, that's not where we go. Mm-hmm. Can we draw a standard or do we have to stay mired in it depends? I I think we have to stay mired in it depends. I, I really do. I don't because everything is contextual. The person, the place, the situation, it's always going to be different. And different people evaluating the situation after it's happened may have different yep, opinions. Very true. You know, absolutely i would imagine that a I'll, I'll use myself as an example when i hear about someone who has been bullied and then responds to being bullied i give that person more benefit of the doubt than someone who was not bullied as a child may mm-hmm. i give them more benefit of the doubt than some legal scenarios may Bottom line, if somebody picks on somebody and it happens habitually, I don't see any problem with that victim doing what is necessary. If if I, I think back to some of the, the kids that picked on me through school, understanding that situation, I would have no problem now had I, you know, punched those people in the face. School wouldn't have liked that. No. Nope. Legal system may not have liked that. In the modern environment, they it would have been even worse, right? The school would have sent me away for who knows how long because, you know, the uh, zero tolerance po- policies in most schools. And this is where I think because of the complexity of the situation, we hear people say, well, what, what's, the, what's the cliche? Rather be carried by six than judged by 12? Yep. Right? I, I've, I've been hearing that more and more lately and and i think there's some truth there if you can't balance it out yeah i mean I, i'd rather i'd rather be alive maybe you know on in prison for 10 years than dead mm-hmm. I mean, that seems like a pretty easy decision i've never yeah. been to so, prison, but I'm assuming. so i think you i think you reverse that though you'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six yeah that's what i meant yeah yeah okay before we get the emails i wanted to get that out yeah well i i appreciate that yeah no i don't i don't want to die not ready. I got stuff nope. to do. Lots of stuff to do. We have another recording to do. So we do. We do. We have to record the next episode. That, and then, <laughs> hopefully, I've got a lot more than that, man. Come on. <laughs> but so, no, you're 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 absolutely right. I mean, all of this stuff matters, and I I think how it is perceived on the outside can make a difference as well. You know, like like you said, after the fact, how other people perceive what happened, and then. I don't, I don't know about you. I don't know what um, intense fight or near fight situations you've been in, but adrenaline takes over and it's not easy to think. You can't sit there and go, okay, so I punched him once. What is his physical state? Mm-hmm. Can I safely disengage and escape with reasonable chance of safety? Let like, me punch him happen. once. 
it, let me punch him once and wait and look at him and yeah. take some time. Like, no, that's no, that, it, absolutely it's... not. And this is why it's always going to be excess. You, you can't help it. If mm -hmm. you are going to defend yourself, you are going to have to defend yourself at least slightly more than is necessary because the nuance, it's not a time for nuance. It's not a time for objective standards and detail. It's a fight, mm -hmm. however you want to slice it. So I think for me, speaking personally, and, and we ha still haven't gone to multiple attackers, but I, th I think this might hold. If the person is down and they are not acting like they're going to get up. If somebody attacks me and I successfully de defend myself and I put them down through whatever combination of striking or grappling, jujitsu, whatever, they end mm -hmm. up on the ground and they are not making a effort to get back up in such a way that I think they will remain a threat. That's when I'm out. That's when I'm going to run. Yep. Do you draw the line for yourself any differently? No, it's the same. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't, for me, I think, and I say think because I have not been like you, I've not been in a, in a, a major altercation in my adult life where I've had to worry about that sort of thing, but I would probably tend to work towards getting the assailant on the ground in some way, shape or form, mm -hmm. and then just running. Uh, I, I don't know that I would necessarily be thinking about getting them on the ground and making sure they weren't going to pursue me. My, if they're on the ground, I at least have a five second head start. I, I think my reason for not running out too soon is person may have a gun. Fair. Yeah. Okay. I didn't think right. of that. I, I, I do. I am going to want to take a couple seconds to evaluate yep. and see what's going on. Because if that person acts like they're starting to reach for something, I should have time to react. Yep. Fair. Okay. Uh, I didn't think three of that. to four paces away. You know, uh, this is also where if I'm escaping, I'm backing away the first few steps. Yep. Oh, yeah, for to sure. Create a, to create a buffer. Uh, and you, you know you know why this stuff is so front of mind, why I'm thinking about those details? The novel what? that I'm writing. Oh, that makes sense. Because this stuff is coming up time and time and again in, in the fight sequences that are in this novel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, For those of you that, that didn't know, I'm, I'm writing a novel. And there is martial arts in it. Yeah, that makes sense. What else do we have to add? Um, I think uh, on one on one, I don't know that there's much. Um, I, I mean, I don't know that I don't know how much this carries weight, but I, I something that popped into my head that I've always thought about is that I would never key eye in an altercation like that. Mm. And I mentioned that to someone once, and they're like, "Well, why? Why? I mean." That they don't they didn't necessarily care, but they were like, you know, why wouldn't you key eye if if you know an assailant is coming at you on the street, why wouldn't you when you attack them do a key eye? And my thought is if Joe Schmo watches that altercation, um, you know, so there's the assailant, there's me, and then there's a third party watching, they might not have seen the first part, but what they did see is me attack the other person and make a loud scream, right? Yell, as opposed to mm -hmm. saying, no, no, no. Like, you know, that is different. You know, screaming no or get away while doing a technique, I have no problem doing. But doing a full-fledged, you know, karate ki, I, ah, you know, yell, I, I wouldn't do that as a, as a, you know, someone who's being attacked. See, it's funny you bring that up because I initially was going to disagree with you pretty hard. But I... I think I agree, but yet I think there's a combination. I think I could easily, maybe not easily, I could key I, key up, whatever you, you may call it in, in your system while saying no. And I've done it. I, I did it once. I, I remember this personal situation where I, without realizing it was happening, let out the most guttural screaming no. And it scared my, it scared me. <laughs> it was i was terrified the other person in the room was speechless yep but that's not something we practice in the dojo no you know we or the dojang we don't we don't practice key, key eyeing or key upping with no so but that's something i would i mean and, and maybe I, we should I would, yeah i i would agree wholeheartedly like i i think 
Because that, from an outsider's perspective watching, you saying no is very different mm. from you screaming. I agree. What I, and I'm not going to do it because we're on mic right now. Right. It would be really loud. But you, right. you get what I'm saying. All right. So let's talk about multiple attackers. Yeah. I think my standard that, that I'm applying here holds true, regardless of the number of people. Are they down? Are they past the point of making a uh, excited effort to get back up? Right? Are they reluctant to get back up? Yep. As long as I can bring everyone to that point simultaneously, which, yeah, it gets exponentially harder with the more people. I'm, I'm not trivializing and saying, oh, I'm just going to, you know, beat up 17 people. Yeah, I'm going to punch them this way, and they're done. Right? <laughs> For those of you in audio, Andrew just just punched uh, to each side. <laughs> um, yeah, it would probably not be super effective, but it would be really funny to watch. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's still the standard I'm going for. Now, you give me two people, maybe three. Ooh, now it's not looking so good. But I'm still that's still what I'm driving for. I'm still driving to get them all on the ground at the same time and they not being excited about getting back up. Yep. Is there anything else? Oh, here's a here's a thing. The more people, I think the the greater the tolerance for the use of force, both socially and legally. I would agree. I, I, I would I would, I would guess think so. I would guess if two people attack you, anything short of you pulling a gun at the onset and shooting them and killing them is probably okay. You could probably shoot it, pull a gun and shoot them in the leg. Mm -hmm. You could probably do anything you wanted with your hands. Yep. But as uh, that's, that's also assuming they don't have a gun. Because if you pull a gun on two attackers with a knife and just immediately start shooting without having some sort of, hey, look, guys, I have a gun. Do you really want to, like, some sort of, you know, back and forth there to give them the opportunity to say, okay, you're right. This is the level of force that I, as the attacker, am not ready for. And so I'll back away. I think that, that I think, does make a difference. I, I think there are different ways that we could unpack that specific scenario, and I don't want to get bogged down in them. Fair. Because the, um, the moment a gun comes into any self-defense situation becomes much more complicated. And I don't want to derail us because I think we're having a really good philosophical talk mm -hmm. about yep. use of force. So I don't, I don't want to get, I don't want to get sidetracked on that. Um, but yes, guns. But I do agree with complicated. you. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, so if, if that's our standard, if we've got a, a philosophical concept that we can use to illustrate what appropriate force is given the situation, regardless of context is there more to say i don't think so i think we've okay. we've discussed it a bunch and it really depends on the situation it's it's yeah. very situational situational dependent situation dependent yeah context no dependent context contextually dependent substantially <laughs> very of a bull a bull <laughs> <laughs> making up words when we don't have ones that work or when we just don't think clearly. I don't think there's more to add. So no, I think I the think question is, what do other people think? Do you have differing opinions? Do, did, is there something we've missed? Is there, you know, like we said at the top, is there somebody out there who has the legal side of this that you can bring in because let, let's do a part two, you know, let's, I would, let's I would love on. to have them on the show. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. So here, here's the appeal. If you are not someone who who could speak to the legal side of this, but you know someone, help us out, hook us up. Let's let's get that person on the show, and we'll we'll chat them up, talk about legal use of force. I do know a couple people um, who speak on this subject, but they are not speaking from any kind of a martial arts context. They're speaking from a firearms context. Gotcha. And, and and I I have a I, I know a, a good black belt friend of mine who is a police officer. He, ooh, maybe he's maybe he's that, someone we could that that might be bring on the show. I would assume that person would be would be a good person. Let's because they they not only are involved and in theory understand the legal side, but hopefully, um, at, well maybe not hopefully, but have likely observed. Yeah, we'll we'll talk context too. We'll talk off mics see what we can figure out. Sounds good. All right. So, if you like this conversation, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, leave some comments on the episode, 
notes. What is this? 567? 567. And if you want to support us, whistlekick.com. It's stuff in the store. There's stuff to share. We got social media. We're at Whistlekick, all, all the places you can imagine. And we've got the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. Thank you, thank you, thank you to those of you who support the Patreon. Andrew, you're one of those people. I was just about to say, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You I'm know. the co-host, but I still help pay for the show. Hey, um, you know you know who the biggest Patreon contributor to the show is? You? Me. <laughs> 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 because somebody's got to cover that expense, and it's me. Uh, other ways you can help us out, you know, we've got books over on Amazon. We can leave reviews anywhere you could imagine. And if you see somebody out there wearing something with whistle kick on it, Andrew, we got to give you some whistle kick swag. I know, I know I've got wearing a martial arts appropriate shirt today. It's a, it's a stick figure kicking the head off of another stick figure. It's brilliant. I love it. We we might um, do our own variant on that. Some, some design <laughs> like that. Uh, I got my whistle kick hat on and you can't see it, but I'm wearing a whistle kick hoodie and actually a whistle kick t-shirt. Whistle kick, whistle kick t-shirt uh oh, is there whistle kick on oh is there whistle kick underwear no we're not going there we're not going i don't okay i mean we could but i don't i don't think we should okay fair i enough. think that i think it goes sideways real fast okay <laughs> there's a great thing to end on so <laughs> stay with me until next time train hard train hard smile, smile and, and have, have a great, great day, day.